panel begins, we have some distinguished uh, members of Congress here with us who are going to share some brief remarks. And we'd like to first call to the microphone a young lady whose seniority in the Congress is such that of the 435 members of the House, she's in the top 10 percent. She uh, co-chairs with Gus Bilirakis the Hellenic Caucus, and uh, she's the ranking member on the Joint Economic Committee and the House Financial Services Administration. If the Democrats were to become the majority of the, of the House, Gus, I'm not uh, pushing that, I'm just mentioning, <laughs> that she would become chairman of the Joint Economic Committee or the Financial Services Committee. Uh, I've got to say, Carolyn's greatest asset is her inventiveness and her creativity. And I remember the very first time she suggested that there should be a Hellenic caucus in the Congress. It was Carolyn who came up with that idea. As a matter of fact, those of us who are Greek and remember that in the Greek War of Independence, it was a famous Admiral Bubalina who fought so well, we immediately identified Carolyn as our Bubalina. So if we might have Congresswoman, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney of New York. Good afternoon, your, your eminence, uh, lay leaders, religious leaders. I, I'm honored here to speak with you and to participate in this important uh, discussion. I, I'd like to thank the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriot for hosting the Third International Conference on Religious Freedom. And I can't thank you enough because this is an issue that has to have light on it, it has to have strength behind it. This picture tells you why. These are Christians that would not give up their faith. They could have lived if they would have given up their faith, and they were all decapitated in Libya. This was just last year, and it is happening all over the world. Uh, so the raising of awareness uh, that you bring is uh, so critically, critically important. Uh, freedom of religion is a core American principle and a key component for peace and stability in the world. So uh, I, as co-founder and co-chair of the Hellenic Caucus and my co-chairs here, the honorable, great Gus Bilirakis, I have long advanced uh, and advocated for reforms in Turkey to respect the rights of the ecumenical patriarch and reopen the Halki Seminary. And with my colleague Gus, we've had legislation in, in past uh, Congresses uh, to do just that. And, and we have in this Congress a bill to, re, to bring back the Greek marbles to Greece. Now, now, the English say it was sold to them, but they didn't have the right to sell them. They weren't theirs. They, they, they were created uh, by Greeks for Greeks and they belong in the Parthenon, and, and they belong in the, in the beautiful museum uh, that was built to house them. Now, we have strong uh, historical uh, support in Congress uh, for Greece, and since we started the Greek uh, caucus, what I'm most proud of is that any anti-Greek legislation has not come even to the floor. They know not to even try because we have the votes to defeat it. We have to build for the votes in Congress to stop the persecution against Christians and other religious minorities around the world. I, I would say that it's not just the moral and right thing to do. It is, it is a security thing to do. Because if you look at countries that respect the rights of minorities and women and religion, they don't have terrorism. It's the countries like Libya with some terrorists in it that are doing these type of things. So we must be vigilant as uh, in government uh, in, in monitoring uh, response and coming up with responses. Now the Manitos team, father and son, have uh, 
urged me to try to come up with some ideas, not just to talk about how horrible it is, but what are we going to do about it? Last year, we passed a resolution in the House of Representatives condemning the anti-Christian persecution that you're seeing everywhere. Uh, but we need to put more meat behind it. These are in countries that are allegedly our allies, yet in Egypt that uh, we give so much aid to. Uh, maybe we should add a rider to the next appropriations bill that says no aid to Egypt unless they allow Christians to rebuild their churches. Right now in Egypt, <laughs> right now in Egypt, it's hard to believe, but in Egypt, say a wall falls down on the church, they won't let you rebuild it. Now they killed all the Jews in Egypt, or forced them out, and they're in the process of killing all the Christians. And uh, the Christian community uh, needs to really band together. And uh, some Christians say, well, that's a different Christianity than me. Well, it's Christians, period. We're all Christians. We should care about every single Christian, no matter what sect or where it came out of. But I think for starters, we could start with the countries that we give aid to and say, unless that country respects and gives rights to religious minorities, Christians, and allows them to rebuild their churches and respects their religion, then they shouldn't get the aid from the United States of America. I also feel that in this Congress and every Congress, it's very hard to pass something unless you have good data, unless you understand the scope of the problem. And I, I feel that Gus and I should put in a bill that requires the uh, Department of State or commerce or wherever to keep a tally of how many Christians are being killed where and what the Christian population is because the rumors that come out that the numbers have gone from 50 percent of the population to 0.002 that that is that is a genocide that is murder and but you can't really really focus and get the resources on a problem until you document how bad it is. And I think that we need to create a system to document exactly what's happening in the world. And, and also, any, any activity helps bring awareness and attention. So we should continue with our resolutions in the United Nations condemning this action. And we should continue with our resolutions in Congress. In the last Congress, we passed a resolution condemning any action against Christianity and other religious minorities. We passed that. But what came out of it? Nothing was enforced. And I think we have to work with chairman, uh, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and others uh, to come up with some enforceable action that you not only condemn it, but you take actions to stop it. I also believe very strongly that our own Christian community, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, Greek, uh, Baptist, Pres Presbyterian, all Christianity in America should band together uh, to raise awareness and to continue to work for concrete ideas to not only talk about how terrible it is, but to put the force of law and the force and strength of the American government uh, towards uh, stopping it. Uh, tonight we have a, we have a meeting in, in the White House. It's the annual Christmas party. And uh, it's a very wonderful time because it brings both sides together to celebrate Christmas and to celebrate our great country. And it's also a time where each member of Congress can stop and talk a little bit with the president as you get an official photograph. And uh, I, I, now, I was wondering, what am I going to ask the president for? Because of this conference and because of your raising the sensitivity and awareness in my heart today, 
I am going to ask him to join Congress in doing something about it. I told you, Carolyn was inventive and doesn't uh, waste any time moving forward on things. Um, <clears throat> our next uh, speaker needs no introduction. Uh, he was in the Florida State House for, from 98 to 06. He's been here in the U.S. House of Representatives for 10 years. You heard this morning that he's the co-vice chairman of the Congressional Religious Caucus. You know that he co-chairs the Hellenic Caucus with Carolyn. He served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. But I've got to tell you, after spending a lifetime on the Hill, you see hundreds of senators and members come and go. And I've got to say honestly, uh, Gus Bilirakis, I've never encountered anybody in our Hellenic community, and we've had some fabulous senators and members, never encountered anybody who hit the ground running as hard and as fast as Gus did. And I would say that there's got to be no other senator or member of Congress who is more sincere and more honest with what he can and can't do and does absolutely the maximum of anything he can on these issues of religious freedom or the other issues of our community. So we're very lucky to have him in our community and with us today, Congressman Gus Bilirakis. Uh, Andy, thank you for that introduction. And I have a duty and an obligation uh, to protect uh, Christians around the world, and it is one of my top priorities as well. Uh, so, but it, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here with my fellow Orthodox Christians. And Carolyn, I'm with you 100%. As a matter of fact, uh, I think together we, uh, we, ha we did do a rider a few years ago uh, to make sure that uh, Egypt did not get the aid unless they treated uh, the Christians, the Coptic Christians, uh, like they should be treated, like for first class citizens. Uh, and they did pass the House and the Senate, however the administration at that particular time uh, used, the Secretary of State used a waiver to, uh, to get rid of that particular rider. But we're going to keep fighting until every Christian is saved. So good afternoon, um, Your Eminence. Thank you so very much for being here. Eminence Dimitrios, Eminence Aguilos. Uh, I don't want to leave anyone out. Your Eminence uh, Dionysios, Reverend Father Crow, and all members of the clergy, my fellow Orthodox Christians. Good afternoon, and thank you for providing me the opportunity to join you here today as co-chair uh, of this afternoon's panel for a solution-oriented discussion to examine the persecution of Christians around the globe and identify possible recourse. I'm honored to be here to join you. Again, uh, it's a highly esteemed, respected panel that we'll hear today representing various Christian faiths and traditions. As a young boy, my parents and extended family instilled in me a deep appreciation for the Greek Orthodox faith, and I strive to uphold the values of family, community, and faith every day. I feel very blessed to be of both cultures, Greek and American, nothing better in my opinion, which have been beacons of liberty and democracy for the world. During my time in the House of Representatives, I have worked to protect religious minorities uh, throughout the world, including the Falun Gong in China, the Ahmadi in Pakistan, the Baha'is in Iran, and the Copts in Egypt, just to name a few. If we as Christians, and more specifically as Orthodox Christians, did not speak out to condemn and fight against the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Christ, then who will? 
Who will? Throughout history, humanity has encountered many faces of evil. Our brightest moments as an international community have been those in which we represent, we present a united front, a united front in our efforts to identify and eradicate its presence. Our darkest moments, I think you'll agree with me, our darkest moments as a human race have come during times when those who knew better stood silently, making excuses for passivity and allowing injustice and persecution to reign. As co-vice chair of the International Religious Freedom Caucus, as a member of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, I'm especially alarmed at the statistics reflecting the dwindling number of Christians in the Middle East and North Africa as Carolyn alluded to. Whether it is Iraq, Iran, Syria, Jordan, Nigeria, Sudan, Egypt, or Turkey, Christians and other religious minorities have been tragically slaughtered or displaced over the last 20 years, not just the, during the last 20 months, and we know how our relatives uh, and friends from, uh, from Asia Minor were treated by the Turks for many, many years. I had a godmother who was forced out of Asia Minor, actually Smirni, uh, at a young age. We are once again facing global evil, and we have a choice to act or acquiesce. We have a duty as United States citizens to protect Christians around the world, ladies and gentlemen. Martin Luther King famously said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We must speak out about the danger Christians in the Arab world face because we know there are few, if any, protectors or allies to be found. There are only about 1,200 Greek Orthodox Christians left in Constantinople. It will always be Constantinople as far as I'm concerned. Constantinople, a place that refuses to recognize the ecumenical nature of our patriarch, Bartholomew, and Carolyn mentioned our seminary has been closed since 1971. Inexcusable. We must fight to protect our fellow Christians all over the world. The right to worship must be protected throughout the globe and especially in the Middle East and North Africa. We must not let Christians face execution for their beliefs, and that's what's happening. In this day and age, no person should ever be intimidated, forced from the ancestral homeland, just what happened in Asia Minor to our people, in prison or murdered because of their religion. Let's stand up, my fellow Orthodox Christians. Let's stand up, even to our so-called allies, and let them know that the United States will not ignore their crimes against humanity. America, <laughs> America is indeed great. At the heart of our greatness is our love of liberty, the light of which serves as a beacon in tumultuous sea, a tumultuous sea of international conflicts. We must ensure that those who would seek to sow fear reap only swift justice in return, as the first nation to constitutionally guarantee religious freedom, I encourage my colleagues in the Senate to expeditiously confirm an ambassador at large, very important, for international religious freedom, uh, to send a clear message to the world that religious freedom continues to be a priority for our great nation. As we gather here to discuss the protection of the Christian faith, I'm reminded of the millions of people around the world who are not able to express their religious beliefs as freely. Today, we should also serve to encourage all of us in this room to rededicate ourselves. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but to rededicate uh, ourselves 
to the cause of advancing religious freedom and safety from religious persecution around the world. Each December, we celebrate International Human Rights Month, confirmation of the inalienable rights to which every person is entitled, including the right to freely worship. This coming year marks the 70th anniversary of the date the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations, a document which has been translated into more than 500 languages. America must remain a beacon of principled courage, recognizing and promoting the basic human rights of all people. Do you agree? And let's pass this uh, Armenian Genocide uh, Resolution too. Let's get that done for our brothers and sisters. If we remain silent in the face of these transgressions, we neglect that moral imperative and do so at the peril of civil society. I promise you that I will never back off of my commitment to this fight. I ask you to join me in that resolve. Talk to your members of Congress, as Carolyn said. Write letters to the editor for your local newspapers. Go see your editorial boards on these issues. Hold prayer vigils in your communities and invite local officials, friends, and coworkers to raise awareness about the atrocities that are committed around the globe every day for the simple reason of preventing people from exercising their faith. While we may not be able to snuff out every act of violence, we can surely work to extinguish international indifference. We can give a voice to those who are silenced. Our brothers and sisters are suffering, dying, and being displaced. They are counting on us to come to their defense, and they cannot afford to wait any longer. Thank you, and God bless you for what you do. Well, our next speaker, um, as everyone knows, there are difficulties Christians are having around the world. And one particular individual, one year ago, a Presbyterian pastor from North Carolina was in Turkey, and he was imprisoned, Dr. Andrew Brunson. He was accused of being a member of an armed terrorist organization, which was the fantasy accusation that they imprisoned him under. And they have been uh, keeping this man uh, for all of this year. And I've got to say, uh, President Trump, when he met with Erdogan, the president of Turkey, brought this issue up two different times. And I've got to give credit to President Trump because bear in mind, those of you who are familiar with what our White House is and is not willing to do to presidents of Turkey, this is extraordinary. Remember, there were five Americans killed during the invasion of Cyprus. For 10 years, our government would not press Turkey to find out what they had done with those five Americans that we thought were prisoners, but they had immediately executed. That's how hard it is to get our White House to press Turkey. But I've got to take my hat off to Trump, who brought it up twice, Pence then brought it up once again. But I've really got to take my hat off to a man who served as director of student ministry at the Baptist Convention in Oklahoma and is now the United States Senator of Oklahoma who is the number one advocate in this country for Dr. Brunson, and we're honored to have him with us today, Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. Senator. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be able to be here with you. And it is a struggle to be able to be an advocate for Dr. Brunson and uh, for what he's doing there. Uh, he has now been imprisoned uh, without charges, by the way, uh, there are some accusations that are on him, but no charges still, uh, 15 months now uh, into his imprisonment. I mean, as recently as yesterday, 
uh, with the ambassador to Turkey to be able to talk about his case yet again. It's an ongoing issue worldwide. But let me put it in context for you. We have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of legislative action, and I'm going to try to present a few of those to you as some things that can be done. But we have it first, for those of us that are followers of Christ, a biblical mandate. And they come from 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must, must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. We have a difficult challenge for those of us that are Christ followers. To be able to speak out clearly for those who are being unjustly oppressed. But to be able to do it in a way that we honor our Lord in the way that he would do it. We watch Paul be beaten severely and then challenge his Roman citizenship and say, I've been unjustly beaten as a Roman citizen without trial. And to be able to stand up for the, what was happening in the authorities of that day, but to also be able to speak out clearly and articulate his areas of faith. We have that same ability if we'll use it with wisdom to both advance the kingdom and advance the cause of righteousness. There's a great need right now. U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms notes, has a report every year. They've noted that religious liberty worldwide has declined in the past year. There are more and more places in the world with less and less freedom. It's a serious issue for all of us. It's a serious issue for those of us as Americans. March the 17th marked the one-year anniversary, now a year and a half total, since there was a genocide declaration declaring Christians are being killed because they're Christians, Yazidis because they're Yazidis, Shia because they're Shia in the area of northern Iraq. Yet very little has been done based on that. As I mentioned before, Dr. Brunson's already been imprisoned for 15 months simply for being a Christian minister in Turkey. There are a lot of issues that we continue to face. Blasphemy laws continue to accelerate around the world. As yet, yet again, Pakistan is debating the advancement of greater enforcement of blasphemy laws within their country. And there's a very powerful movement going throughout that entire region to be able to push harder and harder for stronger and stronger blasphemy laws. What happens with this? What's the right response for it? Well, let me just go through a couple things. Number one, we as a nation can practice what we preach first. If we believe that the free exercise of religion should be a constitutional protection, then we should allow that within our own country to make sure our own practice guards not just the ability to have a belief, but to be able to live your belief. I remind people as, as recently as this afternoon that we in our constitution don't have the freedom of worship. We have the free exercise of religion. That's very different. Freedom of worship says you can go into that place at that time and do whatever you want. Free exercise of religion says you can have a faith and live your faith anywhere you are in the country. You don't have to just have your faith in a closed room at a set time. You can live the principles of your faith wherever you are. It's exceptionally important for us to be able to model that as a nation. And so where we see that gap in our own nation and in our own laws, we should allow that. Sometimes that comes in small ways, like a football coach in the Northwest that can't, after the game is over, kneel down and just pray silently at the end of a game and thank God for protecting his players. I've always been amazed that a football coach who kneels after the game and thanks God for protecting his players can be fired. But a football coach that while his player is injured on the field has no problem if he kneels down and prays for the player that's injured on the field. So I guess you, can th you, can, you can't thank God for protection, but you can ask God for protection. It's an odd system that we have. We have areas of weakness even in our own religious liberty in our country that have got to be worked out. That's important for us because this world needs a model because most of the world does not believe you can have religious liberty. As you know full well, most of the world still practices, if you don't believe like the government, then you're not allowed to have jobs, you're not allowed to marry, you're not allowed to be engaged, and sometimes your own life is at risk. 
Your rights are different if you don't believe officially what the government believes. We've got to set a higher standard on that. Second thing is, two years ago, we worked very hard to be able to get into our trade uh, promotion authority. The responsibility of our trade negotiators that whenever we do a trade negotiation with any country, we bring up the issue of religious liberty. I think it's entirely right to in that moment of economic conversation to also have a human rights and dignity conversation. We shouldn't say we're gonna freely trade with a nation who oppresses their people in religious liberty. We should say while we're discussing economic trade, let's also talk about your human rights and how you allow individuals to be able to practice their faith freely. That's a good hinge moment to be able to talk about those things. That was passed into law, and that is now the current law for the next 10 years in any of our trade negotiations, that any time that comes up, the issue of religious liberty has to come up as well. We pushed very hard on the State Department to be able to implement the countries of particular concern. That ability is already in State Department designation. They can choose to do that, to allow additional sanctions, additional push on countries, and to say your issue of religious liberty is going the wrong direction. Let us allow additional sanctions to remind you that we have a value, that people have dignity, and we're to be able to honor their dignity. We need to continue to be able to push to have the release of Americans worldwide that are imprisoned because of their faith and all individuals worldwide in, that are prisoners of conscience. We've put additional abilities and what I call tools in the toolbox of the State Department that in their negotiations they can allow additional sanctions to be there simply for that issue of imprisoning people as a prisoner of conscience. That's an appropriate tool that I want every nation in the world to know that our State Department can pull that out whenever they choose to and to be able to use that. We need to have leverage that's there to be able to help push nations to be able to do the right thing for their own people as well as for Americans. What's interesting enough is that Secretary of State Tillerson is trying to be able to pull together something that probably most people think already exists. That is a coherent plan for how we work for the release of Americans, no matter what part of the world they're in. As odd as it may sound, there's never been a group within the State Department that works for that. It's an ad hoc group in each region and each place having to relearn those basic skills again. We're trying to be able to pull together a place and to be able to say, how can that be done so that we have experts and professionals that work on this and help advise our embassies and to be able to help coordinate all that effort. And quite frankly, as Representative Bill Rockus already stated, we need to get the Ambassador for at Large for Religious Liberty in place. That person needs to be there as a full-time voice working with every one of our embassies. Do you realize that there is already in law that every embassy has to turn in a report to the Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom about how they're doing in their country on the issue of religious freedom? I like that report. Now, there are some reports that they'll say that's just going to go in a desk somewhere and just get stored. No, here's what happens. Every ambassador in every country has to look at some of their staff and say, what have we done in this country to promote religious liberty? We have to write it in a report and to be able to turn that into the State Department. What have we done? And if all they have is a blank sheet of paper, I want them to hesitate and to say, we need to start thinking about this because we've got to submit this. What are we doing to advance the cause of liberty? It's the right thing for us to do. There are a lot of things that we can export to the world. There's a lot of things that we manufacture. There's a lot of great things that we can send to the world and sell to the world. But I don't think there's any greater thing that we can export than a basic value of respecting human dignity in life and the ability to be able to honor people and the people of faith. I'm unashamed to be a Christian. I'm unashamed to be able to speak about my faith. My relationship with Jesus Christ has transformed my entire life. Every breath that I have, I owe to him. And everything good that's ever happened in my life is because of him. And I don't mind articulating that to other people. And I want them to have the hope that I have. And I don't want my brothers and sisters around the world to live in chains and isolation simply because they believe that there is a God, he loves us, and you can know him. Of all things to not be criminal, I would think that would not be a criminal act. And I pray for the day when we no longer criminalize individuals who believe that God loves his children, even the people that imprison them. Don't lose hope. There's work to be done. But as Peter called us to 2,000 years ago, let's fight for the issues the right way. Let's honor God in how we speak about the issues and how we speak about people. And let's not only advance the kingdom, but let's advance the cause.
God bless y'all and thank you very much for allowing me to be here. If I could ask uh, Bill Antholis to bring his panel up to the seats, and as they are approaching the stage, let me introduce Bill. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's one of, the, uh, one of the best in our national community. He has his PhD from Yale and undergraduate from University of Virginia. The significantly uh, selected as the best think tank in the world, the Brookings Institute, Bill just recently left being the managing director of the Brookings Institution, and he currently serves as the director and CEO of the Miller Center, which is a nonpartisan affiliate of the University of Virginia that specializes in presidential scholarship, public policy, and political history. So he will be chairing and moderating the panel today. Bill Antholis. Thank you, Andy. Uh, um, your eminence, your eminence, um, your eminence, your eminence, and uh, friends and uh, representatives here, it's really an honor and a delight to be with you. And to represent the University of Virginia, we are coming up on our 200th anniversary in two years. And on Thomas Jefferson's tombstone, he only wanted to be remembered for three things, and one of them was not being president of the United States. The first was being the author of the um, United States Declaration of Independence. The second was being the author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty, which was the first religious freedom law in history, uh, in modern history. And then, of course, being father of the University of Virginia. So it really is a, a, an honor to represent um, the university and Mr. Jefferson's legacy. And we have some real heroes uh, with us today that Thomas Jefferson would have been proud of. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is just give brief introductions of our panel, um, their full, in, their full uh, resumes and histories are in your briefing materials and I would refer you to them. Each of them will speak for five to seven minutes, eight minutes, um, and then we'll have a conversation and then turn to questions from the audience. Uh, if you could write your questions down and pass them, um, they'll, uh, George uh, will bring, George Demacopoulos will bring them up and, and I'll read them toward the end. Um, what I think I'll do is just go down the panel in order and um, we will ask each of the panelists to speak um, and uh, in turn and then we'll, we'll start a conversation. So starting at the far end is uh, the very Reverend Father Isaac Crow, who um, is most local to us here. He is a pastor um, in Potomac, Maryland um, in the Antiochian Church. He was born in Beirut, educated there and here in Pittsburgh spent much of his life, almost 30 years, traveling uh, around the Middle East and different parts 
of the Middle East le living and uh, practicing his <coughs> and uh, leading in his faith. Um, and then has come to the United S to Canada and the United States and has continued to make his way south, getting almost all the way to Virginia in uh, Canada, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and now here in Maryland. Um, next to him is Archbishop Kawak, his eminence more Dionysius Kawak. He's the vicar of the Syriac Orthodox Church of the Eastern US. He was educated in Syria, Rome, and Virginia. Uh, and we're delighted to have him with us today. Um, Next to him is uh, his eminence, uh, recently installed Archbishop Angelos. Um, he is, uh, we are delighted to have him here representing uh, the Coptic Church. Uh, he's based in London and has been a leader in uh, ecumenism, uh, youth ministry, and particularly in the, um, in the service of refugees, among other things, and has been uh, many times decorated by the Queen of, Queen of England for <coughs> his work. Anna Kalouris is here representing the Archbishop of Jerusalem. Uh, she's a native of Syracuse, uh, New York. Um, and in her role at um, uh, the Patriarch, I'm sorry, the Patriarch of Jerusalem uh, has been um, working on protecting and, and leading tours and meetings um, at the Holy Sepulchre. Se Sepulchre. Um, and then finally, um, seated next to me is Johnny Messo from the World Council of Aramaeans, uh, Syriacs, um, who is visiting with us from the Netherlands. So I'll ask each of our panelists to speak and then we'll have a conversation and then turn to audience for questions. Um, His Eminence, uh, Kawak, would you, would you please start? <coughs> Thank you, I'm pleased and honored today to address uh, this panel on the, an issue which is extremely vital in today's world, especially in the Middle East. Christian in, in the Middle East, and after establishing civil constitutions in the modern Arab countries, are not treated as Ahlul Zimma anymore, as it was at the era of Islamic Caliphate. And during the Ottoman Empire rule, Christian communities at that time had to pay special taxes, which were called a jizya to the ruler in order to be protected and to practice their religion. Unfortunately, with the rise of the so-called Arab Spring, Christians have started hearing and sometimes paying the jizya. <coughs> Syria, has a long history of Christian presence back to the time of the apostles. After independence from the French mandate, Christian enjoyed an abundance of religious freedom and the right is protected by the constitution. However, after the crisis exploded seven years ago, their numbers also decreased to almost half. The fear of Islamization of the country and the enforcement of the Sharia Islamic law as a replacement to the civil one has forced thousands of Christians to leave their country seeking refuge in other countries. Some Christian communities in the northeastern part of Syria have indeed experienced direct persecution from ISIS and other Islamic extremists, such as the Assyrian and other groups. According to independent sources, it is estimated that nearly 450,000 of Christians fled their country. 38,000 were killed. Four, 43 churches were either completely destroyed or partially damaged. And 27 Christian villages were occupied by terrorists. In Aleppo, two eminent archbishops of the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, Marie Grigoris Yohanna Ibrahim, mm. and the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch, Boulos Yazigi, were kidnapped on April 22, 2013. Despite all efforts, their fate is still unknown. For us, the kidnapping of the two archbishops represents the kidnapping of Christianity. In Iraq, 
the same story is happening. Christians were forced to leave by threat from ISIS and others. Churches were burned and looted. Bishops and priests were kidnapped and killed. And Christians were persecuted. In Mosul, all Christians left their city overnight when ISIS occupied the city in 2016. The question for us as Christians is not only why such persecution is committed against us, but also who is committing it. Christians of the Middle East will never tolerate the rule of religious extremism or be treated as citizens who are not authentic to the region and the land or have no right to live and exist. The fact that they are now in minority in number does not mean that they should be treated differently or be accused by association that they are Western affiliated. In fact, the West did not do much to help us sustain our living in our homeland. The clashing geopolitical interests in the region have resulted in internal conflict and normally minorities pay the heaviest prices in any conflict. The question that possesses itself here is, are we counted by the international community as citizens who have their right to live in peace in our respected countries? Why should Christians leave their original countries to the West in a chaotic manner and keep them living in a limbo of not knowing what to do in their near and far future. Forced deportation from their original countries because of conflicts which they are not part of is not the solution that churches in the Middle East are looking forward to. Having said that, Christians neither need foreign protection nor transfer from their original countries. They rather need support to mitigate religious discrimination and remain in their homeland. In order to do that, there must be serious efforts to push political dialogue to a level where the interest of local people must overwhelm the interest of the international community and to end violent conflicts using peaceful dialogue and tools. Needed to say, this is easier to say than to do, but it is an absolute fact that without ending conflicts, persecution will persist. Tension will not reduce to its minimum. Therefore, any solution which, which uses military means to solve conflicts in the region is deemed to failure and losses, while dialogue is the projection which countries in the Middle East need to pursue and which churches need to support. In order to foresee some solutions, we need first to look at Christians of the Middle East, neither as numbers nor as strangers, but rather as authentic inhabitants. We want this education and culture to prevail, and we want to sustain the plurality of the societies which we have enjoyed for decades without interruption. This leads us to emphasize the issue of citizenship, which is significant to Christians in their respective countries. Equal opportunities, partnership in the development and devolution in the leadership of the country increases the feeling of belonging. In the long term, Boosting economic development is a major cornerstone of stability for people. Alongside that, education is a major tool for promoting religious tolerance, peaceful coexistence, and accepting acceptance of one another. This is a task that local government must work on in modifying educational curricula and eliminate all texts which promote hatred against the other. Monitor religious speeches which ad advocate for religious extremism and endorse 
learning about the other in an open-minded manner, Pot positive exposure to other religious religions can help to deepen the understanding about the other and reduce hatred and discrimination. We Christians are called to be the salt of the earth and the artisans of reconciliation. Despite the difficulties, we will continue to do so and be faithful to our faith, countries, and nations wherever we are. I will end my remarks by repeating the word that our Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 25, 40, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Eminence. Reverend Crow, would you like to go next, please? Thank you. Maybe his, his grace. No, I think his, yes. his grace is asked to go at the end as a, as a sign of humility as a newly installed uh, archbishop. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be uh, with you this, this afternoon as a priest of the Church of Antioch. Um, a little over one month ago, the patriarch of my church was here in Washington for a series of meetings, and uh, he did stay here for eight days. And he uh, undertook a number of consultations, uh, both in Congress and in the State Department and also in the White House. And uh, he told us at the time <coughs> that his mission was mission impossible, and yet we are the people who believe that we are the children of the God in whom all things are possible. I'd like to begin my presentation with a quote from uh, a talk he gave uh, last month here in Washington. It concerns the witness of the Church of Antioch. I bear to you the witness of love from the Church of the East, from great and small in Antioch. Antioch, which is great in the faith of her children and in the power of her rootedness to her land, the land of the apostles. Antioch, the great city of God, of the apostles, which has been smashed against the rocks of her history and the cruelty of days long past, and present. Antioch today crucified and desecrated, called by her Lord to the witness of a martyrdom in which it is to anoint the inhabited world with the light of Jesus Christ. Antioch, which ever seeks to fulfill its mission through a patient and sacrificial fidelity to that light which comes from the East to that light which is the incarnational life of the Spirit, and to that light which has called its faithful to assume a living witness to the meekness and to the humility of the gospel of our Savior. Antioch, with its long experience of coexistence and pluralism, <clears throat> which has always expressed and lived the conviction that the church is to be the conscience of the world, and that its role is to proclaim prophetically the will of God for human dignity and life. And that this life in abundance belongs to all, to all peoples, to all the nations, so that the children of the one God, of one Creator, become truly the children of the resurrection. Amen. Patriarch John is speaking here about the vocation of the Arabic Christian Church, the Apostolic Church of Antioch. And uh, there is something uh, very difficult to elucidate in our current setting here in North America about the witness of the Antiochian Church, but I will try my best to emphasize it. The pluralistic dimension of the Church of Antioch has shaped its theological discourse from its early years 
Antioch has had a unique experience of multiplicity and diversity, both ethnically and culturally. It has always represented a rich human and cultural tapestry, resulting from the encounter of the civilizations of the ancient Near East with Greek and Roman culture. Later in its history, Antioch coexisted with Islam, experiencing both tolerant openness of the early Islamic rulers and the strict rule of the Ottomans. Due to its cultural and historical circumstances, the Christians of Antioch did never experience the triumphal dominance of an established Christianity, such as was seen in parts of the Byzantine world and in medieval Western Christendom. Brethren, the, 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 the Christians of Syria, who are the Christians of the Apostolic Church, <coughs> wish to remain in their homeland. And Patriarch John, in his visit, spoke again and again about the witness of the Mother Church, still there, in Damascus, in Syria, in Lebanon, where I was born and raised, and in other parts of the Middle East, including parts of Jordan and Palestine, and the modern-day country of Turkey, which is part of the Antiochian homeland. And uh, he emphasized that the solution to the <coughs> preservation of Christianity in the homeland of the Middle East is the recognition of the rootedness of apostolic Christians in the Holy Land itself. Several years ago, during the invasion uh, in northern Iraq of the Nineveh Plain uh, by Islamic extremists, by Daesh, by the ISIL extremists, the Christians, uh, of course, were attacked, persecuted, and thrown out of the, their homeland, especially in the area around the city of Mosul. And we remember at the time that the president of France, at that time his, he was uh, president, Francois Hollande, he said, how many of them are there there in northern Iraq? And we know that the Christians in Iraq were perhaps more than a million at one point. Uh, he was told that now the refugees, those who had escaped to the Kurdish areas, etc., may be numbered 250,000. And he said, 250,000 is not too much. Let's bring them to Europe. We can save them. And the Orthodox Church of the East does not accept this solution. Brethren, uh, the Christians of the Middle East belong to the region. And they have been given by the Lord a special vocation <coughs> to remain there, to coexist with others, and to serve also as a bridge in the encounter between the Muslim world and the culture of the West. They are there by consequence of the common language and history and culture that they share uh, over many, many hundreds of years. Survival of the Christian communities in the Middle East depends on many factors. Those of you who have been uh, uh, involved here in Washington in efforts to support the Christian communities in the Middle East know that there is nothing simple in the region. And uh, I was very appreciative this morning of the remarks made in the first panel <coughs> by Father Sidney Griffith and by Professor Skidros and by Professor Movastian uh, about being careful to learn the lessons of history. Uh, if we don't learn those lessons, then we might be subject to making a bad situation worse. And the history of outside intervention in the area, however well-intentioned, has often been to the detriment of the survival of the indigenous Christian communities. And I speak especially for the church of Antioch, for my church. So we must be very careful uh, of how we proceed. 
Certainly, there is much that can be done to support, as my brother and my father in Christ, his eminence, said, the institutions of the communities of the Christian churches in the area. Because they are there and they wish to remain there, and they need our help to remain there. <clears throat> to survive there, we also, as Western Christians here living in the West, have to undertake an exorcism of our own. We have to exercise the notion that war is the solution to every problem. And this has not been the history, either of the colonial era or of recent events in the Middle East. <clears throat> the enemy of the survival of the Christians in the Middle East is every form of intolerance, of fanaticism, and of extremism, both secular and religious, both Muslim and Christian and Jewish. Because such an ideology, from whatever source it comes from, denies that the other is also a dignified creature of the same creator. And this kind of thinking will never lead to the salvation of the Christian communities. Any kind of thinking which proposes an exclusive right to truth over the denial of others will lead to conflict. And this has been the history of the region. Uh, I like to end my remarks with a, a point of hope. I was uh, so grateful this morning to hear the message that His Eminence Archbishop Dimitri read from His Holiness the Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, because in it we heard the voice of the Gospel of our Lord that we are called to that witness to uh, a coexistence and to a common recognition of our humanity with others, even those who are different from us. And that uh, all of our efforts to live together, both in the East and West, have to come from our own ability to be faithful to that calling. Uh, it is the more difficult way, and uh, it is not a way which can lead to any simple answer for the survival of the Christian communities, but I believe it is the way of uh, uh, repudiation of violence, the calling for dialogue. Uh, in a place like Syria, for example, the Christian communities wish to remain as part of uh, a nation to which they have been uh, uh, raised and uh, to uh, forge a future, however tenuous and difficult, uh, with those whom God has put them in close proximity with, in their neighbors, with their neighbors. Thank you. <clears throat> Johnny, do you want to? Uh, you? Anna, Johnny? Whatever uh, works. Well, why don't we start with Anna and then sure. Johnny and then his eminence. Thank you. I would like to convey the blessings and greetings of his beatitude, Patriarch Theophilos III of Jerusalem, who is currently in Russia, continuing a shuttle tour, garnering international support for some of the issues I'm about to discuss. We thank the Archons of the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle for organizing such an amazing event to grapple with this issue of our time. All the churches in the Holy Land were completely united and immediate in their response to disturbing developments that unfolded this summer. Following increasing efforts in the last few years by radical settler groups within Israel to alter the Christian character of Jerusalem. The developments are twofold. On July 26, an unprecedented bill was presented to the Knesset. The so-called Bill of Church Lands which quickly gained 40 signatures with its initial proposal, aims to severely restrict the rights of all the churches 
over their own properties and lands. It is the result of lobbying efforts from the Jewish National Fund and radical settler groups with a like-minded agenda to undercut the churches, particularly the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, which is the largest property owner among them, and which recently challenged the JNF for refusing to negotiate fairly on the extension of leases. Since July, a firestorm of baseless attacks in the media have fed into a campaign designed by the JNF to divert attention from their own errors and wrongdoing. Regardless of this bill's chance of passing into law, its mere concept, its mere concept and immediate backing by a third of Knesset already demonstrates a very dark reality. This is a turning point in which radical elements are fighting to strip Jerusalem of its multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and multicultural integrity. The second occurrence in July of this year was a Jerusalem district court ruling against the church, mainly regarding two landmark hotel buildings belonging to the Patriarchate in the old city's Jaffa Gate. In 2004, under the leadership of the now deposed Patriarch Irenaeus, an unauthorized deal for long-term leases was made with the radical settler group Ataret Kohanim. For 10 years, the Patriarchate has challenged this illegal deal, during which it unequivocally proved that the person concluding the deal was not authorized by the Patriarchate. He had received a bribe, and there was bad faith, conspiracy, and we proved that agreements were made without the due authority of the Patriarchate. Despite the abundantly clear evidence, the court ruled in favor of the settler group. An appeal has been filed, but a danger is materializing in the meantime. These radical settler groups feel encouraged in their openly stated mission to, quote, liberate the Holy Land from all non-Jewish elements. Last November, members of this group, Ataret Kohanim, forcefully tried to seize part of the Patriarchate's Gethsemane Dependency, which is a monastery, which is in the courtyard of the Holy Sepulchre Church. They broke through the ceiling and erected an iron barrier. In the last few years, settlers have increased their violent conduct, especially toward Christians, in an attempt to intimidate them out of the city. They harass and spit at our clergy on a daily basis, desecrate our churches and cemeteries, uproot our trees, block our entry to pray at some common sites such as the Last Supper Room, and regularly commit arson. For this, civic authorities put out condemnations, but the reality is that the perpetrators face virtually no consequence. When civic organs of the city of Jerusalem, particularly the municipality, do not actively pursue visions of inclusion and mutual respect, they aid such a vision of exclusivity and intolerance, and in fact normalize it. Commitment from the government is an essential element in fostering peace. Their silence in the face of violence sends a clear message that such hateful acts are tolerable. This is not the disposition of peacemakers or protectors. This is not the attitude of people who understand Jerusalem for the holy place that it is, a place of encounters between human and divine. Jerusalem embraced the bodies of the prophets. Its winds carried their voices. In fateful hours, its earth soaked their blood and hosted their relics. If this is what Jerusalem is for the whole world, who could be bold enough to claim it only for himself? Most of Jerusalem's holy sites are sacred to more than one, if not all three faiths. In fact, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Theophilos III, argues that Jerusalem itself as a whole is a holy site. Who can say that a holy site should be accept accessible to some but not to others? In the Christian tradition, the holiness of a particular place is not dependent on our presence there, because holiness is not created by us. We simply nurture it where it's found. Therefore, anyone can be allowed to share in its sanctity. Fighting for exclusivity over holy sites per se defies their very nature. In this wisdom, the mission of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem has always been to protect the holy sites as places of worship, open to all people indiscriminately, the best example of this is the Holy Sepulchre Church itself, where at any hour, any day of the week, you'll find every religious group inside visiting, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and more. The walls and floors are smoothed over by the hands and feet that have passed over them. 
This is not an accident, it's by design. This mission of inclusion has allowed the church to survive countless invasions and war over the course of 2,000 years. In one of the Holy Land's most beloved examples, during the Arab invasion of 637, Patriarch Sophronio signed a covenant with Omar ibn al-Khattab, who was a successor of the Prophet Muhammad, which led to an age of peace where there otherwise could have been war. This covenant is recognized until today by all religious and civil authorities upheld by the Patriarchate, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority. Yet, Ataret Kohanim and other radical settler groups are propelled by an aggressive motive to remove non-Jews from Jerusalem, as well as Jews that they consider non-conformant, and they're gaining ground, especially in the old city, which is Jerusalem's crown and core. They use underhanded methods such as coercion and undue authority to acquire property and, in their view, redeem the land. Jaffa Gate is one of the strategic centers for achieving this goal. It lies at the heart of the Christian quarter and is the entryway and artery to all the church's headquarters, as well as hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who visit the Holy Sepulchre Church only meters away. If settlers gain control of this area via these Jaffa Gate properties and push out tenants with the type of intimidating and violent tactics they're notorious for using, they will be able to implement their vision to permanently change the status quo and work toward erasing the Christian presence from the old city. Let us work in our respective capacities to protect the churches, pillars, and buttresses of truth and the Christian presence, which are a testament to and the protector of the sacred heritage we share. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Christianity can be declared clinically dead in biblical places like Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. Second, due to the disastrous effects of U.S. foreign policy, upon the Christians of Iraq and Syria, America would do well to assume its responsibility and moral duty to help save and protect these neglected victims. We cannot forget that these brave people live in a hostile region and still carry the banner of the religion of America's founding fathers, who furthermore defended core values like religious freedom, liberty, self-government and equality that these vulnerable minorities are yearning for in a region that seems to dispose of pluralism and diversity. I appeal to your good conscience to act and to make your colleagues realize that America cannot waste time, but must act now to prevent the looming death of Christianity in its native lands. The following seven steps will help realize just that, and you can help us to achieve them. First and foremost, Aramaeans do not wish to leave their homeland. Therefore, we must end their declining presence through humanitarian and development aid. We can also consolidate their position by contributing to peace and security, and especially by giving them incentives to stay home, such as creating job and education opportunities for the youth. Second, we can strengthen their organizations in the diaspora to represent the social, economic, and political issues of their people at state level. We can fund them to monitor, document, and publish about the human rights abuses at home, to lobby for recognition and appreciation by their governments, to take part in the Geneva peace talks on Syria, and to legally fight the ongoing confiscation of land and property, as in Southeast Turkey, that belong to ancient churches, monasteries, and families. Third, we can help them to rediscover and claim their Aramean roots, just like the Armenian and Greek Orthodox, for example. The Aramean Christians are a people in their own right with a rich cultural heritage. As the indigenous people of Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, they used to be the, major the majority before they were decimated, became a minority, and became victims of state-sponsored assimilation programs. That's why many of them became disconnected from their communities. However, we can help them revive their cultural heritage, including their endangered Aramaic mother tongue, which is well known to you as the language of Jesus. 
The best example comes perhaps from Israel, where reborn Arabized Christians from the Maronite, Syriac Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and Catholic churches rediscovered their roots and worked together to obtain recognition from the government in 2014, allowing them to change the misnomer of Arab Christians on their ID cards to quote-unquote Aramean Christians. Fourth, as Christians, we must focus on a strongly organized Christian lobby, both nationally and globally. Remember that America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and that its president and members of Congress for the most part have been Christians. Isn't it odd then that our existential question as Christians is not dominating the agendas of America and the international community? The Trump administration offers us new and interesting opportunities in this respect, which we must not leave unexplored. Fifth, you can help us reach and convince the White House to develop an appealing vision and issue a memorandum on how to help Christianity survive and thrive in its homeland and take this existential question into consideration in US foreign policy the coming years and decades. The Middle Eastern Christians have much to offer. We just have to begin brainstorming about how they can become reliable partners of America in securing its interests and vision for a secure, democratic, secular, and plural region where one day in the near future, law and order, law and order must also prevail. Sixth, together we must repeat as many awareness events as possible in Washington, such as this top level conference, in order to instill a sense of understanding, compassion, and especially urgency in state officials with respect to the long ignored existential question of Christian persecution in general and in the Middle East in particular. Last point, their calls for a safe haven and autonomous province in the Nineveh Plain in North Iraq have been recognized by House Concurrent Resolution 152, and we must capitalize on this. We can empower Arameans to defend themselves and secure their future at home. Perhaps this might attract many hundreds of thousands of Arameans who left their homeland, like me, and who are still reluctant to go back home anytime soon. These seven steps could be kicked off in Washington by the US government with an international consultation on ensuring the Christian presence in the Middle East, like the one I recently attended in Budapest and that was organized by the Hungarian government. To speak in Trumpian terms, imagine the huge, I mean huge, hope giving signals to persecuted Christians if President Trump himself would address and engage the civic and religious leaders of the Middle Eastern Christians who should be requested to propose, to propose a vision 2030 and 2050, and also invite world leaders to participate in such a high-level conference. As an Aramean Christian from the Middle East, who is in contact with our IDPs, refugees, and people in the diaspora, I can assure you that the realization of these seven pragmatic steps will help regain their trust and renew their hopes and prospects for a future at home. The next 10 years will be crucial they will be either marking the end or the revival of Christianity in its birthplace. So please, please let's write history together by acting now. Thank you. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We are not speaking about victims here, but we are speaking about powerful witnesses. And that is how we should address them, deal with them, and advocate for them. Your eminences, your graces, dear distinguished sisters and brothers, this wonderful order of St. Andrew. Being someone who was brought up in Australia, I tried to go back to my high school days to my best Greek 
and try to give you a salutation in Greek. But everything I remembered from those high school days could not possibly be related in such an august gathering. <laughs> so I will say first, thank you. Thank you for organizing this, and thank you for the heart you have for those whom we stand to remember. As we approach the Feast of the Incarnation, we remember that millions are still going to receive this feast, but receive it very differently. They will walk in the footsteps of their Savior, being persecuted, being displaced, and as we in Egypt know far too well, because Egypt was the refuge for the infant Christ and his family, being refugees. We come at a time when there are somewhere between 200 and 500 million Christians persecuted around the world in scores of countries. The exact statistics are not important, but we know that they are there because they will vary. What we do know is they are in the millions and they are suffering at a time when we as humanity are in an era of our development that prides itself in international treaties, international conventions, and a right to life. Having said that, before we speak for these wonderful witnesses, we need to raise the bar. Life is not a privilege, it is a right. Dignity is not a privilege, it is a right. Existence and tolerance are not an option. We need to raise our expectations so we can offer them so much more. The Christians of whom we speak are those who deny and reject minority status, for they are indigenous people. If what is happening in the Middle East were to happen to the indigenous people of America or Canada, Canada or the Aborigines of Australia, the world would be up in arms. These are truly indigenous people who live the faith that was born in the region and that continues to be because of their lives and their witness. There is also no single mold for these Christians. The Christians of Egypt are different to those of Lebanon and Iraq and Syria. And so there is no one solution. So we need to stop being prescriptive. How many times have we heard that Christians must stay in the area because otherwise Christianity will die, or Christians must leave because they have no existence. Surely that is their decision. Surely that is their call. And surely it is up to us to respond to their need. If they want to stay, then provide a safe space for them. If they need to leave, then provide safe corridors. It is up to us to listen to them so we can provide what they need and what they want. And also to understand that this is no longer a regional problem. See, it's much easier to distance things when they're over there. There is no more over there. Because people who are over there have communities and families over here. And we are all part of one, especially as Christians and especially as the body of Christ. But even as humanity, this is an international epidemic. This exceeds the ability of any single person, organization, faith, even nation state to fix. This must be a collaborative response, bringing together. Policymakers, 
religious leaders, and civic society. Bringing all of our abilities together, all that God gives us to represent them. We also need to challenge the fact that religion is the cause of all destruction. Religion, in our case Christianity, is very much the solution. And we are here gathered as advocates, but as Christians, to bring to light that which God calls us to, to represent even the weakest and the most vulnerable. In my own church, the Coptic Orthodox Church, almost 150 people have died in the past 12 months just for being Christian. Between church bombings, shootings of pilgrims on their way to a monastery, and targeted attacks on individuals just for being Christian. That is, of course, besides the scores, the hundreds and thousands who have been personally affected as members of families, communities, churches, of a whole church in Egypt and abroad. yet they still continue to be strong. They do not stop practicing. They just continue to practice knowing that they are more vulnerable, that they are more of a target. And in the eyes of those who pursue us, who have called us their favorite prey, a valuable target. Yet we are not struck down. These men have become iconic. The martyrs of Libya, they change the world. Typically and traditionally, Coptic Christians would have a, a, a cross tattooed on their wrist. Just as a sign, that's who they are. I grew up in Australia. I didn't have one. Didn't see the need. But when I watched this video, and the incredibly courageous man in the middle having to mask his face so that he would not be known pointed that knife and said, we are after you, the nation of the cross, I felt a need to get this cross for them. <laughs> they have brought to us what we have historically become desensitized to. We hear the stories of the saints in our churches and our liturgies every day. Oh, not another beheading another martyr, another saint. It's still happening. It happened on our screens. We saw it before us. Our own church, the synod of our church, has declared them martyrs, not canonized the saints, but unquestionably martyrs, and has set aside a day of their martyrdom to be a date for us to remember and celebrate contemporary saints of our church who will just continue to be in these coming years, we expect. Egypt is struggling to rebuild, and there are more and more problems. There have been historically glass ceilings, no Christians in authority, no equal opportunity, what we see in the Middle East, what we're seeing now, didn't happen overnight. This has happened over decades. And yet, because it was over there, it, it was left to happen. Sisters and brothers no longer on our watch. It doesn't need to happen anymore. It cannot happen anymore. Because as they are cut, we bleed. It's the same body. Let's lose the language of the church of the East and church of the West. There is only one body of Christ. It rejoices as one and it mourns as one. It also struggles as one. In seeking to re represent our sisters and brothers, we need to look for <clears throat> the precepts the models of religious freedom globally. Because where the persecution falls upon 
a Coptic Christian, or an Orthodox Christian of any sort, or a Catholic, or an Evangelical, or even a Rohingya, or a Baha'i, or a Sufi, this is abhorrent in the eyes of God. Because God gave us all his image and his likeness equally. And he calls us to be advocates for that image and that likeness and for that sanctity of life equally. We cannot stand with any kind of credibility advocating for our own if something happens to my neighbor and I just say, am I my brother's keeper? The answer in the scriptures was absolutely. We are not only our brother's keepers, we are our brother's advocates. And we must never let them suffer alone. Illiteracy and poverty are very difficult components of this problem because they make people more vulnerable, more open to radicalization, less accepting of others. If we turn to scripture and the Gospel of St. Luke, we read that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, prophetic words of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those pressed. And that is the whole of humanity, and that is our calling. Or a quote that I ran across from St. Cyril of Jerusalem recently, everywhere the Savior becomes all things to all, to the hungry bread, to the thirsty water, to the dead resurrection, to the sick healing, to sinner's redemption. And we can add to that, to the persecuted and to the displaced, hope. And that is our role. That is what the church needs to be. Under Article 18 of the Universal Charter of Human Rights, we are told that everyone shall have a right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Inalienable rights. Rights that no one, has the ability, the gift to take away. God gives us the right to accept or indeed to reject him. So who are we to impose him on others based on our own ideology? Who is anyone to tell me what to believe or not to believe? Who is anyone to take away that right that God, God, the omnipotent, has given me? Solutions are that we don't just want to complain and condemn, not even the enemy, because the enemy is just as broken by sin as we. So we pray for the enemy. We condemn the actions. Recently, some of you may have heard that I issued a statement after our own brothers and sisters in Egypt were shot. It was, an, it was a message to the perpetrators saying, you are loved. Your actions are abhorrent and detestable but you are loved by my God and by me and by millions like me. Because you have the same nature, image and likeness as me. And we pray that God, who speaks to their hearts, has that place where their eyes are opened and they see that sanctity of life that must be a component for them to turn away <clears throat> from seeing other humans as mere commodities. We cannot commodify people into bargaining chips. So what can we do? We need to work collaboratively. Nelson Mandela says the purpose of freedom is to create it for others. We here sit free, we speak free, we live free, and we need to use that same freedom for others. We need to understand and alleviate the suffering that others feel from their own context and, able, and try to provide for them. Five points. The first is responding to immediate need for humanitarian assistance. I have been to Erbil. I've been to the Greek Macedonian border. I've been to Beirut. I've been to Zartari in Jordan. I have seen all of these displaced people, and there is a need today. 
The church is carrying out an incredible role. But the church cannot do this alone. Nation states must work through the churches, the bodies on the ground, because whether people like to admit it or not, the Middle East is a religious place. And it will continue to be that. And the religious organizations are those which will continue to be most effective. Secondly, using where we are to continue to speak truth to power. We're thankful for what has been done on this great hill in London where I am and around the world. But more needs to be done. It's not fair for us to continue to complain. We must say thank you. But we must also say our journey is not over. We need to reiterate that there is a real interest for our nations here in the stability of the Middle East. There is an interest in the stability of Egypt and, a, and broader because what happens there spills over onto our shores. Because what happened in Egypt started the targeting of Christians but then moved into the police, the military, citizens, and now Shiite and Sufi Muslims. We need to continue to be a moral compass. Without basic affiliations to politics, because as, as a clergyman I don't do politics, but advocacy is well and truly my remit. And that needs for us to be moral compasses. Thirdly, to keep the issue alive even when it falls off the top of our news feeds. News moves very quickly and things are forgotten. We don't want to fall into the place that some people think we're in. When you remember wor the words of Hitler when he said, who will remember the Armenians? We remember them. We still speak for them. We advocate for them. We are blessed by their struggles and we know that this is something that continues. Fourthly, collaborate on all of the above. We have a horrible direction of reinventing the wheel all the time. In business, people rationalize. They streamline. They use common gifts to do and reach a common thing. There is an incredibly iconic view of His All Holiness the Patriarch of Constantinople being in Egypt, standing in St. Peter's Church that was bombed with His Holiness Pope Toadros and His Holiness Pope Francis. That is an image, an icon, that will never be taken away from people's memories and will continue to inspire them. I want to close with a, a, a quote from Pastor Niamola, based on all of this collaboration, who said, first I came for the socialists, but I did not speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Do you want? Great. So, I, um, as I heard people sp speak, I had a number of prepared questions, but the conversations were all so powerful and so moving with themes about um, the history of place, the necessity of tolerance, the necessity of understanding. And uh, I would like your indulgence to, for me to bring it back personally. In our small town of Charlottesville, we had Nazis march this summer, chanting, Jews will not replace us and chanting blood and soil. And I just wonder that moment where I saw our little town's name on news feeds all across the world. Does what happened here in the United States on religious tolerance and freedom matter where you are? And if it does, 
how should we think about and talk about that in the United States today? Um, when we talk about your cause, should we put it in our own context or should we put it um, in a broader ecumenical context? Teach us how to talk about these issues, if you could. It's all very interconnected. These are, these are now, they are global movements. Um, and there are phenomena, uh, not meaning to make a political statement, but what happened here with the last elections, what happened in England with Brexit, what's happened throughout Europe with vot votes and referenda. There is a movement in a certain direction which should be alarming us all. And so every time this is flagged up, I think it adds to a greater awareness and consciousness of what's going on. I'll add something. I think that um, it's interesting enough that we're talking about the persecution of Christians here, but actually it's the church itself as an example that offers the best solution. The church and the Christian f identity, philosophy, and tradition is one that is inclusive of all people and loving of all people all the time, without exception. And any movement or act of hatred or uh, fanatical ideology that we see in our, t in our time, whatever time we might be in, um, can be completely solved if we adopt the mission that the church has adopted, which is to be inclusive of everyone. It's a solution that applies across the board in a religious context, in a political context. So I think that the church is something that we can all look to, whether no matter what your faith is, no matter, um, no matter what you believe in politically or otherwise, um, the church offers an example that has worked. It's worked, history is the proof. We're witnesses of it. The church, despite all of the, his the sad history that we've talked about today and this morning, the church has survived. And I think that this is not just a phenomenon. It survived for a reason. So I think we should look to the example of the church um, for solutions. Thank you. For me, it's <clears throat> I understand where the question comes from. I think from my perspective, if you look at, for example, what happened in your village, your town, uh, and what's happening in the Middle East, for me, it's hard to understand um, or to make a comparison between the both of them. I think in the Middle East, we are witnessing like a structural problem, a real phenom phenomenon that is going on for centuries, not just decades. Uh, that's one. And the second thing is, um, with respect to the Middle East, unfortunately, we are dealing here with a region where the best speeches about peace, fraternity, pluralism do not resonate with the people. We can give the best solutions, but unfortunately in the region, the reality on the ground, it doesn't reach the people. And in your uh, town, I would say maybe you can qualify it as an incident because you have certain towns in every country, even in my own country, those things happen, in the Netherlands or in other European countries. But it's not a general phenomenon that is tolerated or uh, you see uh, tolerated by government uh, you, see, you don't see a state from Europe or America turning a blind eye to these things, as far as I know. But in the Middle East, the things that are happening there are either uh, tolerated by a state or sometimes even sponsored by a state. And as I said, those are not, no incidents there. Um, we are really talking about gru um, gruesome um, atrocities like genocides, ethnic cleansing, uh, change of demography. Um, erasing the memory of people, like calling it memory side. That's, I think, something different than uh, what's happening in the West as we can speak. Thank you. <laughs> Your Eminence. I think it's, it is a very difficult question to answer, but as I said in my, uh, during my remarks, it's very important to work with the governments of uh, uh, of the region there. We need to push them uh, to make 
the notion of citizenship prevail. And as, 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 as I said, we need, we need to boost the economic development because if there is no economic development, Islam will be the solution and we, we are going to suffer. And as I mentioned during my remarks, it's been, it, is, it is very important to change something in the educational system. Sometimes by my neighbors, the Muslim, they, they see me as, uh, sorry to say it, as an animal. They don't know anything about Christianity. So for this reason, the hatred will prevail and we have this kind of violence. So can I ask one last question, which is what gives you hope? If you, could ev if you could summarize in a sentence or two, a phrase, an experience, a, uh, a particular memory, or a living active partnership, is there something right now that is giving you hope in your work? Oh, definitely. I must say conferences like this one by the great Arkans, it gives me tremendous hope, encouragement. Uh, as a Christian that I feel not abandoned, that I feel um, encouraged by fellow Christians who are, as much as I am concerned about a serious question here, when I hear senators and congressmen talking about uh, their hard work, which they are doing for years, just to bring the question of the Christians on the agenda of uh, the United States, I know that it takes time, but I take hope from that. I take hope from the recent speech by uh, the Vice President, Mike Pence. When I watched it, um, I felt an energy inside of me that, that felt like now you have to go again, like move forward. I felt uh, fired up again to work on the issues of our people. So these things are giving me and our people who are persecuted in the homeland a lot of hope. It's just now that we have to try to accelerate this process a little bit uh, and, and try to make sure that humanitarian and development aid uh, reach them as soon as possible, if not, uh, uh, if not now, then tomorrow. Let me say that it gives me hope, uh, the promise of Jesus Christ that he is going to be with us till the end of the ages. But also, I agree completely with uh, Johnny Masso. And the third thing that, despite that many young people, they left our countries in the Middle East, still many of them, they are willing to stay and participate in the rebuilding of our countries. For this reason, I have hope. I have, um, sorry, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I have two things. Um, first of all, it was Jesus Christ himself who told us to always have hope. And um, he warned us of everything that we're facing today. It's the same, even from Jerusalem. Sometimes, you know, it's different for me there because ever since um, seeing the places where the gospel unfolded, I can never read it the same. And I remember his words, and when things seem very difficult, his words always ring true. Um, so we can take his words to heart, and they never fail us. The second thing that comes to mind is an experience I had um, at one of our refugee camps. The Patriarchate is, through our Orthodox initiative, is helping thousands and thousands of refugees who are not actually in the official camps in Jordan they are seeking to go back home, and a lot of them have gone up toward the border, and for this reason, they're not being officially aided by the Jordanian government, but to help them, the Jordanian government is actually um, following a closed-eye policy, which means they're being left alone, but at the same time, they need a lot of relief. And I went to visit them this summer, and they were doing, uh, we've set up kind of an unofficial school for them since they can't go to the official schools yet in Jordan. And these kids, from what I've been told, I didn't see them when they first entered, but from what I've been told, they were depressed, shy, quiet, sad, traumatized. And after some months of being given hope from the churches and being given aid and being given food and being allowed to express themselves creatively, their, all their personalities changed and they just blossomed into the kind of young people that we would see today in our American schools or in our Western schools. Now, when I was visiting, we did this little pop quiz activity where the person who was um, taking on the teaching exercises with the students had given them a long list of 
questions to, to memorize and, and answer. These kids were as small as maybe four years old up until 10 or 12. And when the teacher was reading off the questions, they were sitting there in the middle of the desert on these colorful chairs, and they were raising their hands and waving their hands, teacher, teacher, teacher. They wanted to show off their knowledge. They studied. They studied in their tents. They studied with the food parcels that they were given for dinner, and they were um, growing. And for me, that was human resilience at its finest and most innocent, and that gave me a lot of hope. Great. I think two, two very quick things. One is our Lord's very realistic, reassuring um, quote, in the world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. So I think that the tribulation is definitely there, but it's overcome. The second thing is that there is certainly more awareness now. And, and that's a very good thing. Because of gatherings like this, uh, members of Congress here speaking, you know, in the UK, parliamentarians, and around the world, similar models. Because, uh, tragically, because the issue has spilled over into Europe and North America, there is not only a greater awareness, but a greater interest to do something about it. And so I think it's gone up the agenda and I hope that it continues to be up there. We have hope uh, because the Holy Spirit is alive and in the church. And we don't have the word, the, the option of despair. Uh, if we are true to uh, call ourselves the followers of, our, of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, the task of education is a huge one especially here in the West. And our uh, brothers and sisters in the Western tradition know very little about the reality historically, culturally, and spiritually of the Christian communities in the Middle East. So we have a huge task. And uh, it's rather daunting one, but it's not one we should despair of. The other thing I would say, uh, to share with some of our visitors today is uh, uh, the Christians of the Middle East are very resilient and they didn't survive for 2,000 years without uh, that strength of faith. Uh, our patriarch told us that he formed in uh, every diocese in Syria where the war is raging a team of young people who are uh, some of them students, some of them scouts, some of them aid workers. <coughs> and uh, they form like relief teams. Every time a church is hit, they go there and they clean it and they repair it. And the next day, a service is held in that church. Every time a family is displaced, they go to that family and find temporary accommodation. Of course, the, the needs are so great, but this is the, resi the spirit of uh, resiliency, uh, which, which is uh, in, in the church through the Holy Spirit. So we, we have to be people of hope. Otherwise, we don't accept. <laughs> well, I, I know that I speak on behalf of, of all of us uh, in thanking you. Evcharisto, uh, you give us hope. Uh, with your faith, your work, and your love. Um, and we, we just can't thank you enough for, for traveling all this way um, and, and being part of this. So thank you. Thank you.